Hi, Dr. Russ here today with Daniel, who is talking about some right-sided neck and shoulder issues, gets stuck sometimes, has some success stretching it out, and um, sometimes a little less success. So we're gonna see what we can find and what we can do about it. So let's start with your turn around, and we'll look at Daniel's neck from behind. A Little bit more turned, thanks. Okay. Just getting a sense of the whole structure. Very nice, a lot of symmetry, which is good. Are you right-handed? Yes. Okay. So here, around his right rhomboid and upper trapezius is a little more muscle mass, just correlating with being right-handed and using that side more. And getting a general sense of the palpation first Really the only thing that's jumping out at me is tightness here. And here, so his upper trapezius here, overlying the rhomboid, which is coming down to here. That's the bottom edge of it there. And then the lower trapezius comes up here. It's pretty thin, flat sheet there. And nice movement through the latissimus and a nice level sacrum. So let's see what we can do to palpate his neck vertebrae and their movement. And we're gonna start from the top with his occiput, uh, my middle finger on the occiput and my ring finger on the atlas. Daniel, I want you to let me move your head around a little bit. I know that's not easy. And I wanna feel for the glide on each side of that occiput on the atlas. We'll see that movement is just a few degrees of nodding. And then as I turn his head, I wanna feel the atlas on the axis. And so as I turn him to the left, the right side has to glide forward. And as I turn him to the right, the left side glides forward. And I'm feeling that glide with my fingertips as I induce the movement and he's helping, which is fine. And it's a little bit tight here on the right side, not moving forward quite as well. As we get down to C2 through T1, the movement we're most interested in is the side bending, side to side. And Daniel is tall, has a long neck. And when someone has a long neck, it's the vertebrae that are tall. He's got the same number as everyone else. So on Daniel, you can see my fingertips are separated as I palpate the vertebrae. Or on someone smaller, even just my size, my fingers would be touching. So I can feel nice movement actually through these lower cervical segments until we get right there. And we could even see a little more resistance to rightward side bending than to left. That's C6. And the way you can tell C6 from C7 is you have the patient tilt their head back and C6 will slide forward. And C7, which is right here, will stay put. So I'm at C6, 7 on the right, and I'm interested in helping to induce some better mechanics in right side bending which will take some stress off of this little slip of muscle right here. And I'm gonna move your head a little more now. So as I come down into the upper thoracic spine, it still responds to cervical side bending. We're just taking it real slow and easy. Remember, he told us his neck is bothering him, so we don't wanna crank it. And getting a sense of rib movement here. Remember, here's the scapula, so his ribs are coming here. And take a couple of deep breaths for me. Nice, and out, good. And again, it's, everything's pointing right here. This is where it's getting stuck. Can you raise both arms up over your head? Mm-hmm, good. And bring them down, out to the side, all the way down, thanks. He's got full abduction of his shoulders, which is good. Um, if a person has a frank shoulder injury, they're, they're not gonna be able to do that. So that's a just easy, quick screening test. Another one to do is, Daniel, can you take your right hand and touch right here, or as far as you can reach? That's great. That's really good shoulder movement. Let that down. So we're dealing with a basically intact shoulder. Left hand here, if you can. Perfect. Let that on down. So what I want to do is um, have you lie on your stomach, and let's work this area kind of in combination with the whole back, okay? Yeah. Great, let's start with you laying face down. We are gonna work the whole back, but I'm gonna start by saying hello with a little 
direct work on the rhomboid and the upper trapezius. Those are the two muscles that are creating the most symptoms. And anytime those two muscles are problematic, I'm thinking about what's going on in the front of the shoulder as well. Those pectoral muscles and the muscles around the collarbone or the clavicle can get tight, pull the shoulder forward, and a lot of times that's really at the root of this upper shoulder, upper back, neck issue. So what I've got my fingers doing here is I'm getting under the rhomboid and creating a little mobility, separating it from the layer of fascia that overlies the outer part of this upper rib cage. Taking my time, moving slow, and not spending too much time on any one little piece of muscle. For one thing, we don't want to irritate it. And for another thing, we're going to come back and work at it again. And let's just get a little movement and a little blood flow in there and see where that gets us. This part here, I've got the trapezius muscle between my fingers and right there is just the fascia. So Daniel's pretty slim. His superficial fascia is, is a pretty thin layer. That's it right there. And when I've got the muscle between my fingers here, the mass of the muscle gives me this big. Yeah, so he's taking nice breaths because he's probably getting a lot of sensation with this touch as I'm right on a knot or a trigger point in his upper trapezius muscle. So again, we're not going to overwork it. We'll be back. Let's come to the left side. There's his fascia. Feels pretty smooth. There's his muscle, also pretty smooth. Now everyone's a little sensitive here. If I wanted to squeeze it really hard, I'm sure we could bring out some pain and tenderness, but that's not necessary. I like to work the other side because I feel like the whole concept of left and right in the body is just abstract and notional. Where does the left side start and the right side end? Well, we could say it's right on the spine, but as his right rhomboid comes up here and attaches to the spine, it just rolls over and becomes the left side. It's one continuous sheet of tissue. And they're certainly intensely neurologically connected as well. When one contracts, the other has to relax. So I kind of think of them as one functional unit. Picking up on a little tightness here through the lower back. So let's do a little work there as well. Couple of nice deep breaths here, Daniel. Thank you. I really like to feel the patient's rib cage move when they breathe, or in some cases, not move. Keep breathing. I like to envision like a tight t-shirt underneath the skin that's right up against the rib cage, really tight, front, back, and sides. And that's what that deep fascia is on the outside of the rib cage. There can be a lot of tension and restriction in there, literally tethering the ribs down toward the pelvis and uh, making it hard to breathe. So there's a lot of fatigue and anxiety that comes from having too much carbon dioxide in your blood, which comes from not being able to take nice deep breaths. So having good freed breathing apparatus is really key to the health of every cell and especially the brain, which needs so much oxygen. Okay, you're doing great, Daniel. Time to focus a little more on this right shoulder. So I'm gonna come around. 
I like this position to work on the shoulder prone with the patient's elbow draped over my thigh. I use a towel there just so there's a that tactile barrier between my leg and also that way I don't get any oil on my clothes. And um, so what I can do is uh, really gently give traction with my leg just a tiny bit. I don't have a grip on the arm with my thigh, but just the bent elbow and a little bit of extra push with my left hand. And we're just starting to get a little space between the ball and the socket of the shoulder. And that's helpful. And as I'm doing that, I'm inducing a little more length through the upper trap. So this is very much where his symptoms are coming from. And I would like to get a little bit of a length and increase the pliability of this upper trapezius muscle, which right now is um, not at all deconditioned, but I would say chronically tight. So when a muscle gets tight, it decreases the blood flow through itself and then the tissues get a little bit dry and fatigued. So here my thumbs have found some good trigger points in what we call the posterior axillary fold. This feels like it's his teres major and teres minor as his latissimus is right here. And now I'm going to raise the table up a couple of inches so I can get one hand under the ball of his shoulder and the other hand on his elbow here hooked in. And now we can really give some traction. Does that feel okay, Daniel? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. So any tingling comes up in your hand, let me know, okay? So good. I can really get some movement through his scapula here, inducing depression and retraction feeling for any bumpiness and crunchiness and just kind of trying to work through that. And now, sorry, with this hand in the front, I can get a sense of his pectoral muscle, which is a little tight. So we're going to put a bookmark in that. Say we're going to turn him on his side in a few minutes when we're done here and work on getting some movement through the front musculature of the shoulder pectoralis major and minor, anterior deltoid, and coracobrachialis. But first, let's uh, just kind of work this tension out through the arm lines. The upper trapezius blending to the deltoid, and then the deltoid through this lateral intramuscular septum to the elbow. And then from the elbow down through the wrist extensors all the way into the hand. So we can work that back arm line, as it's called just with some gentle stretching and fascial mobilization. I'm giving about two or three pounds of traction through his whole arm, whole arm right now and I'm getting a little release from his fingers. We're going to do a similar thing now through the front line. Here's his biceps as that comes down and attaches to the front of the ulna. And then from there, through the deep wrist and finger flexors, so I've got his elbow in extension and I'm giving a little extension to his palm. Trying to get movement and length all the way up to the elbow and from the elbow all the way up to the front of the shoulder. Get to open up all kinds of lymphatic channels and venous circulation as well as creating nice sensation from the fascia. It's an important part of this treatment is the touch and also the sensation that the patient gets in their own brain from feeling these tissues stretching and elongating. It's like, believe that it's something the brain sort of forgets it can do. So it's nice to soften it and lengthen it and get some blood flow through it and then take it through a full range of motion to kind of remind the brain, hey, this, this movement is possible. So for the next stage, let's have you laying on your back and we're going to finish up the upper trapezius here and then move on to the pectoralis. Okay, as always, we want to locate everything in the front of the neck before we start working because we have our neurovascular sleeve and on Daniel with his thin layer of fascia, we can see it right here, a nice little eminence. So we've got his clavicle comes out, hooks into the acromioclavicular joint right there. This is all upper trapezius here, posterior scalene, 
middle scalene neurovascular sleeve, which we never press on, and the anterior scalene is going to be here. So now that we know where those nerves are, I think we can feel safe starting to work in here. So we're not going to grind or put pressure on those nerves. Giving a little stretch here to the scalene. Turning away and tilting away from the side. And again, I'm behind those nerves, so I'm going to do a little bit of pressure here. Come all the way into the first rib. And giving downward pressure toward his feet and a little bit toward the table to get some stretch through that scalene. And we got to try to create space between the posterior scalene, the levator, and the upper trapezius. And that is right here where my middle finger is. I'm on the front of the upper trap, following it down, coming to the space of adhesion right here. And that's where I want to start to induce some movement. As I'm just ever so gently, two or three degrees, moving his head into a left side bend to get some stretch through that tissue. That's nice. Good. Good. And don't forget the upper attachment here at the occiput. The upper trap feels actually pretty smooth. And all those suboccipital muscles and fascia blend right into the fascia overlying the cranium. So this all one line comes over the ear through the temporalis muscle and hooks right into the jaw. Lots of people have that exact pain pattern. It's like a question mark of pain that then also sometimes gets a big uh, headache right behind the eye on the same side. That can be super annoying or even debilitating. So again, checking in with the left side which is good. Patient's taking a nice deep breath, seems pretty relaxed, which is good. Coming up over the temporalis. And a, a nice little gentle check-in with the masseter and those muscles overlying the TMJ. So let's check in again with this atlas movement. It's much better. That is not gonna need an adjustment. Releasing the upper trapezius gave that a lot more movement. Let's check in with C6, and you can see that's still a little bit stuck, right? So Daniel, why don't you turn the light on your left side so you're facing the door, and we're gonna work the right pec. Okay, ready? My favorite way to approach the pec muscle is with one hand under the arm and the other hand over like this. So I can get from the sternoclavicular joint here through the upper ribs. Daniel, can you bring your top leg forward a little bit? There you go. Mm -hmm. If that feels like too much twist on your low back, just let us know. So I can move his humerus and assess for mm, what his pec muscle thinks about this kind of movement. And it doesn't seem entirely thrilled with the idea of just kind of a simple retraction of his scapula or abduction of his arm. So we're gonna work with that. And a nice approach for this is to actually get a thumb behind the pec muscle just like that. So just like I was uh, approaching his upper trapezius before by getting a little bit of a squeeze, I'm approaching his pec muscle here. I keep sliding out from under my finger because it's this tight bundle. So I'm gonna, I gotta approach it gently because every time I squeeze it, it just kind of slips out. So nice, easy breath. Good. There we go. Getting a little bit of a stretch on it. Starting to separate a little bit. I had a teacher once who um, liked to describe these bunching muscle fibers as like that bundle of spaghetti in the pot that's all stuck together, which is, I don't know, weirdly delicious to eat, but not that good in a muscle. So he's like, how would you try to tease apart those spaghetti fibers to get the water in there so they would boil and separate? And we would think about 
doing that to the muscle, which is what we're doing. So here on his pec now, I've got my finger pad pressing down into the pec and my fingertip has got the fascia. And this is where a lot of the adhesion and restriction is here between the superficial and the deep fascia, a little closer to the sternum. And it's really just a matter of unclumping the spaghetti. Good job. So let's see, how does it feel now about this movement? And it's, it's better. It's like a lot more, um, it's a lot more okay with the movement. And our next little spaghetti clump is right here. So his pec major comes here, I'm on the bottom of it, the inferior side. This is his biceps here and his anterior deltoid here. And this feels very much like this biceps tendon and pectoralis muscle crossing over each other. Daniel, can I really have the weight of your arm? There you go. And uh, now it's just getting stuck together. So all this myofascial work is usually about getting mobility between layers of tissue. In this case, the pec major and the biceps tendon. So freeing up movement in the shoulder is going to take a lot of pressure off the neck. It's going to help his posture because his shoulder blade will be able to find a better position back and down on the rib cage. And now we're just dealing with a little bit of excess activity and tension in the serratus anterior in those deep intercostals which have sort of adapted to his shoulder being forward, which Good, adaptation is good, but let's give it the opportunity to readapt to the shoulder being in a better position. So as I'm gently inducing a little retraction of his whole right shoulder, with my right hand, I'm giving a stretch to that deep fascia, pulling it back around along the angle of the ribs, right toward the spine. Good. So this very much is an approach to a pinpoint of pain in the upper trapezius that involves the whole neck, shoulder, upper back, because it's all one great big thing. So come lay on your back again, and let's feel what C6 is doing. Potential need for a neck adjustment, and I don't know. It feels like what we did took a lot of pressure off of C6, and it really feels like it's moving. Any any residual stuckness in there, I'm feeling coming more from the suboccipital muscle than from that C6 segment. So this is a visit that would not include a crack. Some people are okay with that. Some people are a little disappointed. <laughs> Were you hoping for a... Always. Always. I have a fond memory of the first time you made that one crack that fixed me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't think you need it today. Is that all right with you? Sure. Okay, good. So, um, thanks, Daniel. I appreciate your participation very much. Take your time. Thanks for watching. <laughs>